It's a few days before Mother's Day, and uh, a mom had been informed that her grown adult kids in different states had not planned to be home for Mother's Day weekend. So she decided about a week later after stewing about it, she called her daughter and her son and just let them know she was going to be leaving their father. And she'd had enough of his belligerence and his laziness and his cranky attitude. Immediately, the son and daughter begged her, don't do anything until we get there. We'll be there tomorrow afternoon. She hung up the phone and told her husband, the kids are coming for Mother's Day. <laughs> so, there's one, if you ever need it, it works, you know, just, just use it if you need to, so. Mother's Day finds us, I believe, at a unique moment, um, it, it, as if it's not the first one, but a unique moment in our world and in our country about the incredible value of a woman. And Mother's Day can be as exhilarating for some and as painful for others as it is exhilarating. Mother's Day can be a really tough day, and I'm mindful of that, of the ladies in our church who today uh, probably couldn't even come because it's just too painful. On the other hand, there are many also, though, who are here today and it's a celebration for you. And that's one thing I love about the body of Christ. We can all celebrate when it's time to celebrate. There's a time to weep, a time to cry, and there's a time for all those things. And even on a Mother's Day, you might find those various reactions. But I wanna encourage you today. That's my goal today, to encourage the women in this church, the moms, the grandmoms, the uh, stand-in, fill-in moms and daughters, and I, wanted, I particularly just want to encourage. There's a text in the Bible in Galatians. If you have a Bible, you want to open it and look at that. It's in Galatians chapter 4. And it says this. It says, For you're all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And all who've been united with Christ have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. And there's now no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. When you come to the scripture and, you want to, and I'm talking today about what the Bible says about women and particularly about women as they function and lead and serve in the church. And as we talk about that, there's some things I want you to keep in mind. We always come to the Bible having to understand a couple of things as we dig into the truth of the Bible, as we can learn what we're supposed to be learning from it as God intended when he gave it to us. We always need to understand every text we're reading, there's a history involved. There's something in history at that time that perhaps this text might be addressing, but others are timeless there's a cultural factor. What was going on in the culture of that time? What was going on in the church that Paul might be addressing in some of the New Testament writings? There's a context. What was the specific issue that might have been spoken of? Why was it being talked about? And then you have in Scripture, you always come to Scripture with understanding two things. There are principles of Scripture that are non-debatable, and there are convictions about things we hold that we may not agree on. But the principles, we find complete unity and complete agreement. And I can just rattle off a few, but for example, I believe the core principle of Christianity would be that Jesus was born of a virgin, he died on a cross, he rose from the grave, he's coming back. Those are principles, just some principles. There's no debate on those matters, no debate. But there's all kinds of convictions about how some of those things are going to happen. There's varying views, as I've said before, of how Jesus is going to return. And, and people really get in all uh, up in arms about this. They can get really hot about this and argue about this. Well, no, he's going to be this, going to be this. Or no, no it's going to be that. And, and frankly, I'm thinking uh, God's just getting a big laugh out of all that because the Bible's pretty clear. We don't know when it's going to happen. And predict all you want. We're not going to be standing there on that day going, I told you this is how it was going to go. Now, do we want to learn? Yes. Do we want to have 
a thought or theories or beliefs about surrounding that core principle of Jesus' return? Of course we do. It's just when we start arguing that our particular view is right and yours is wrong. And there's no room for that in the body of Christ. There's room to feel that, to think that, to not maybe see eye to eye on certain things. I can assure you on Mother's Day, we would get a hundred different, if not a thousand different ideas about the best way to discipline kids. It would be all kinds of thoughts because we all have to discipline kids based on who we know they are, based on what we know about them, based on how, they're, how we're kind of uh, sensing or praying that we would understand them and know how they're wired together. And, and we learned early on with three kids that you, you can't do the same approach to all three of them. Now, in principles, there's the same principles. We're all going to go to church on Sundays. That's not up for conviction. That's not up for debate. We're going to church on Sundays. Of course, I had to, and, and I figured they ought to go with me anyway. So, <laughs> Dad's got to go. <laughs> we all have different ways of seeing things, different ways of doing things. But I want to talk to you. I want to encourage you, ladies. I want to tell you what I believe the Bible says about you by reminding you what God had in mind for you. I grew up in a church that taught me from day one the vital importance of women serving and leading in a church. I didn't know there was anything different. I didn't know there was a debate about it. I didn't know others didn't see it that way. But it was modeled right in front of me. It was not uncommon for my dad to invite women who were pastors of large churches to speak in our church, gifted teachers and preachers and leaders. And yet I would later come to be surprised that there were those who thought that was absolutely sinful. And I understand and appreciate different views, but again, I want to give more of the core principle here and where we come at it, being as Wesleyans in our roots, what this means. I want to encourage women to be everything God has equipped you to be without reservation. Knowing that even in this room, in all of our rooms, there will be differing opinions about this. I'll, I'll never forget uh, going to the Netherlands. I was uh, privileged to be able to and be invited to train and teach pastors over in the Netherlands. So uh, I did that for three years. I would go twice a year. It was on behalf of John Maxwell's organization. And so I did that for three years, twice a year. And my first visit over to meet uh, everyone and do the first conference with them uh, was pretty fascinating. So I'm, I'm in a room. There were some, most could understand me. Uh, and somewhere there was translation going on. Uh, some can speak clear English and still not understand me sometimes, as you all know. So you're very accustomed to this. So we had this great session. We had great worship together. We're uh, probably 100 men and women sitting in this room. And it came time at the end, and I prayed and closed in prayer. And the host got up to uh, the podium and said, okay, wonderful. He was very kind about me and what I'd said, and it was helpful and all that. And then he said, okay, the bar is now open. And I thought, I've never been to a pastor's conference like this one. <laughs> and all of a sudden, these folding doors in the back of the auditorium opened. One of the biggest bars I've ever seen in the planet. <laughs> and it was time for fellowship. <laughs> I'd, never seen, I'd never been to a pastor's conference that had that kind of fellowship. And it's none of your business, the choice I decided to make that evening. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. I know. I'm going to get it when I get home on that one. <clears throat> if you'll not tell her, then she won't hear it the next service. So. But what I learned with my friends across the ocean, we all agreed about the same thing, the same principles. We were one in heart, mind, and soul about the core, non-debatable principles of Scripture. But they saw things differently on some other issues that I didn't see or that I didn't quite appreciate or whatever it may have been. But we had unity because we focused on the core principles that united us as believers. You may, uh, if you follow this kind of news, it's been uh, in the last year where Rick Warren 
uh, was invited to leave his denomination, and it was because he had a view of women in leadership and ministry and preaching that uh, was not appreciated uh, at this point in time. It had been in, in previous times, but somehow it had become apparent that that was no longer allowable. And so he was invited to leave the denomination that he built, one of the greatest churches in the country, uh, for the last 45 years. And so he was interviewed about what changed your mind about women's roles in the church. What was it that changed your mind? And it's, it's worthy of repeating because I think he made great sense for it. And, uh, and I want to read that, some of this to you. Now he points out that we went from 120 people in the upper room becoming the official religion of, to, to becoming the official religion of the Roman Empire 300 years later. From 120 to 300 years later to have thousands involved in the church. The church would grow 50% each decade for the first 300 years. The early church had no pulpits, no idea that one guy would stand behind a pulpit and preach. That wasn't New Testament worship. Paul says everybody has a song, everybody has a scripture, everybody has a teaching. It was in a house and everybody shared it. And it was studying some of these things, Rick said, that gave me a whole new look as something I'd missed for many years. A couple of things. One was, he said, a rereading of the Great Commission for All. He outlined the scriptural basis for women in church leadership, beginning with the Great Commission. And he said, we have a great commission to go make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. It's go make disciples, baptize, teach. And he said, there's no way among those four words, go make disciples, baptize, teach, that you can't, you can't say, well, the first two are for men and women, but the last two are for men only. He said, no, I believe it's all, it's for everybody. When that was given, the Great Commission was for all of us, all men, all women. Who authorized women to teach? Jesus. Who authorized them to lead? Jesus. And he said, all authority is given to me. Therefore, he said, go and do these things. Go and do these things. So the Great Commission was one of the first sign, uh, signature moments for him. A second one was a re, uh, re looking at the Pentecost. He said, the second thing that changed my mind was looking at the day of Pentecost. He says, on that day at Pentecost, we know there were women in the upper room. We know women were filled with the Holy Spirit. We know women were preaching in languages other people couldn't understand in a mixed audience. It wasn't just men. Women were in that audience on the day of Pentecost. Women were speaking. And how do we know that? Because Peter felt obligated to explain it. And so in Acts chapter two, verse 17 and 18, he says, hey, these people aren't drunk. What you're seeing is foretold by Joel. They heard all these different languages being spoken and, and then the uh, non-believers were kind of hurling these insults at them saying, oh, they're just drunk. And, and Peter makes clear, no, 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 we're not drunk. What you're seeing was foretold by Joel in the Old Testament that it was going to happen. And now it's happening before our very eyes. And then Peter goes on to explain why you're seeing now women preaching and speaking and prophesying. Joel said it. He said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy. That's back in the Old Testament book of Joel. So from the day of Pentecost in the church, everybody Everybody has a gift. Everybody shares that gift. Everybody gets to speak who has that gift of speaking or, pro or the prophecy. And people who don't like that ignore this verse. And then there was a third thing Rick said changed his thinking on this. It was the very first sermon, the very first Christian sermon, the very first Christ-centered sermon was delivered by a woman who told the men. He didn't say to Mary Magdalene, go get one of the disciples. I have something I need you to tell them. He didn't say, go get one of the disciples. I've, I've got to let him know some good news so then he can go and tell everybody else. No, no, no. Mary was the first one there and Jesus said, you go tell the disciples. You go preach the first sermon post-resurrection. You go let them know that he who was dead is now alive, just as he promised. That was intentional, it was a whole new world, 
and he has the woman taking news to the disciples. There's so much we can say about all of this and there's a lot that can be said and there's a lot that doesn't need to be said. But I wanna make this clear, this is our, one of our principal core convictions about how God uses and equips and calls women to serve in the church, to lead and to speak. And you hear from them throughout the year and they're gifted communicators. And I, we would be very, very uh, remiss if we did not celebrate the gift that God has given them, whatever gift they may be. They're to be valued. Warren said one more thing that caught my attention. He goes, I believe in the inerrancy of scripture. In other words, it's exactly as God intended it. He said, I believe in the inerrancy of scripture. He said, but I do not believe in the inerrancy of your interpretation. So we are free to see this differently. We're, we're good with that. I'm, we're good with that. You may not be. But you need to know this is what I believe the Bible says about how we should respect and treat and listen to the women in our life. God has a specific role for them. And I'm glad this is a church that for 64 years has lived that out and continues to. It's one of our core values and principles. Now I tell you that because more than anything today, I wanted to encourage you. I, I just want to encourage you. I, I think being a woman is, is uh, challenging as, as is being a man. There's not, we, we all have our challenges unique to whatever sex we are. But I, I want you to understand that when God made us male and female, he made us to serve one another. And there are certain callings on men and certain callings on women, certain gifts that men have, certain gifts that women have, and we're to value those. And when we get those together, when we value that in each other, it makes for a phenomenal marriage. When we can see and appreciate and together in ministry, whether we're volunteers in the local church or whether we are on a staff at a local church, we can serve together, each one expressing the gifts God has given us. So I tell you that because encouragement is what is needed today. Encouragement. There are some things about encouragement I want to let you know about. I think it's good for all of us to know this. Uh, men, I think it's especially good for us to maybe take a few notes here because we tend to be forgetful. Encouragement, <clears throat> I believe encouragement is a sign of spiritual growth. As Jesus fills our heart and soul with his love and grace and mercy, we really can't help ourselves but wanting to encourage others to know the same thing we know. A frequent phrase that you'll find and I will use uh, came out of, I learned it first in the 12 steps that really trying to get, uh, when you're inviting someone to a 12 step meeting, you're showing one beggar where another beggar found bread. And that's what we do. I'm just a beggar helping other people find the bread that I found. And there's many different ways we can say that. But I believe encouragement is a sign of spiritual growth. It means that I'm secure enough in who I am that I can be encouraging to someone else without feeling a need to get some back. And it's frankly fairly easy to spot someone who has not been well encouraged because they're going to start with the need to tell you how good they are. The conversation will somehow get back to them. And that's always a sign of some insecurity. Perhaps they've not been encouraged as they should have been along the way. But encouragement to me, a person that can encourage genuinely encourage and, and translate and give good words and kind words and affirming words. That's a person who's spiritually strong. Another thing about encouragement and why it's so important today, encouragement reinforces that someone is on the right path. You sometimes wonder, am I doing the right thing? Have I made the right decision? And it's always very helpful, particularly with those you trust 
and those you've asked to always speak truth to you. It's always good to hear their affirmation, to say, this is really good, or I'm really glad you're doing that. It's amazing what can happen when we just simply encourage. And I think encouragement does, it gives strength to those who are discouraged. Any given day, we can all be discouraged. We have those discouraging moments for a variety of reasons. But then someone will come along and encourage. And you know, many times, I always believe, God, you gave me that today because you know I needed that today. I needed to hear those encouraging words today. We all need that, men and women alike. And I think another thing encouragement has done for me, certainly, it inspires people to greater things. It really does. Let me give you an example that um, is very special to me. And it happened four, four or five years after I got here, what I'd been told came true. And I marked it off when it was first said to me. It was 1981, and I was... Uh, Involved that last Sunday in my home church in Ohio uh, in the orchestra. That was my favorite place to be. I never wanted to stand out here. I wanted to sit back there and play the horn. <laughs> because I, I can't, you know, I can mess up a note, but if I s play the wrong note, nobody's going to get mad at me. If I say the wrong thing, I'm in hot water, which, you know, happens frequently. So we were getting ready to go from the choir area into the sanctuary, and there was a gentleman on our staff that had been my dad's pastor in college. Dr. Dale Oldham was his name. Dr. Oldham was the pastor of Park Place Church of God there in Anderson, Indiana, where my dad went to college, and mom, where my brother and I went to college, and, and a lot of our family and friends uh, went to Anderson University. It's a wonderful school. And when Dr. Oldham retired from preaching, dad asked him to join the staff in Ohio, 90 miles away in Dayton, Ohio, and he did. Dale Oldham was a guy that uh, if I could have found a recording of his prayer, I would have played it. When he prayed, I, it was like heaven was opening. I mean, you know, there's people that have that gift. When Dr. Oldham started praying, it was like, I better look up because I think Jesus might be coming back. I mean, that was Dale Oldham. He was a wonderful brilliant, gentle, humble, gifted man. So we're getting ready to walk onto the stage in Ohio in May of 1981. And he stopped me. He put both of his hands on my shoulders. It's a little uncharacteristic of Dr. Oldham, but he put both his hands on my shoulders. And he said, proud of you, Marty, I'm, for what you're going to do. I, I know that this is a I was, I was leaving for Oklahoma the next day, and he said, I know this kind of catches you off guard, but I want you to know I believe God is in it. And then he said this. He said, Marty, I believe God's going to call you to preach one day. And I walked away from that conversation going, he's really losing his mind. <laughs> I love this man. I didn't want to say a word to him, but I wanted to say, Ain't no way, baby. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not going to happen. And four years later, in the fall of 1985, this small church full of crazy people asked me to be the pastor. And every now and then I go through the files and I'll look at something I said 10 years ago and I think, oh boy, I should never, that was bad. Throw that one away. You know, I, I'll just throw them away hoping no one remembers them. But God has used that. Dale Oldham was one of many, frankly, in my life growing up in a church. And that's why the church is so wonderful. That's why I believe so deeply in it. It was in church where I received the greatest encouragement consistently throughout my life. And it was that day in church when Dr. Oldham saw something I didn't. I'm glad I was in church on that Sunday. I'm glad I was there. Encouragement inspires people to do great things. 
And I would say it's probably true for all of us. Somebody somewhere in all of our lives saw something in us that we didn't see in ourselves. Or maybe every now and then someone says something to you about you or your kindness or something they find in you that is just really wonderful. And it means a lot to hear that. Still does. We all need encouragement. And particularly today, I wanted moms, women, whether you're mom or not, women to be encouraged. To be encouraged to be all that God has in mind for you to be. Because it's very confusing these days. The messages are very odd that are coming your way. I want to encourage you in hopes it'll inspire you to greater things. And one more thing I've learned about encouragement is it always brings emotional strength. We just need some affirmation occasionally. So there's a lot of ways we can serve each other, we can encourage each other. Several ways we can do that. Yesterday, uh, I went to see mom and uh, kind of giving you, a, I guess, my play-by-play of how things are going. She's in a wonderful memory care place. And yesterday, she was furious with my dad. And I didn't bother to tell her. He died eight years ago. And they divorced 38 years ago. <laughs> but she was just not happy with him. And because she'd heard him out in the kitchen all day, but he never came in to say anything to her. So I just went along with her on it. No need to say anything different. But I was able in that moment to just switch the, kind of change the subject kind of quick and say, mom, you've just, you're an awesome mom. And in all her confusion, she heard that. And it meant a lot to her. Mom cries just like that. <laughs> Those tears come quickly. But even in that state of mind, it was an encouraging word. She said, Mom, you've been a great mom. You still are. Even if you call me 10 times a day, even if you need me to door dash your food, you know. <laughs> now, I, there are some days I'd, I'd do that a call, call forward. Uh, to my brother's phone, just annoy him. But, because uh, he gets the same calls. We, we both, we both are in this together. <laughs> I'm getting all mom's calls today. What's going on? Well, I forward, you know. <laughs> but it's the power of just simply good, kind words. We underestimate them. We forget how important they are. We forget how necessary and needed they are. So I want to encourage you as a church, let's keep encouraging one another. Let's encourage the leaders among us, men and women. Let's encourage our moms who have their hands full of life, many of them helping to raise kids as well as working full time. I don't know how you do it, but I want you to be encouraged today. I want you to know that God is pleased when we serve him, when we receive from him that which he gives us, when he says things to us that remind us who we are in his eyes, when the Bible speaks to the gifts and abilities he has given to you, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Serve others. Bless others. Do random acts of kindness. Do things that are just unexpected. Peggy Noonan is a, uh, edit, writes uh, a column occasionally. You'll see her in the Wall Street Journal. But uh, she was a special assistant to Ronald Reagan when he was in the White House. It's an interesting true story. A lady named Frances Green, who lived in California, had sent a dollar a month for eight years to the Republican National Committee, a buck a month. Now, these days, someone would say that's about all they're worth, and that's why she did it. That's not why she did it, all right? That was her contribution to the party of her choice, all right? Buck a month. So one day she receives this uh, beautiful envelope from the Republican National Committee. Beautiful piece, thick uh, cream-colored paper with black and gold lettering, inviting her to come to a reception at the White House to meet the president. 
That's all she noticed, and she was getting ready to see what day is it, and let's get packing. She forgot to notice the RSVP card that said required, along with a five-figure donation that was also required <laughs> to be invited to meet the president. She showed up in Washington, D.C., followed the instructions, got in line, only to get to the check-in counter and be told her name is not on the list. Frances Green could not go in. Thankfully, the story is told by a Ford Motor Company exec who was standing in the line behind her, kind of watched the story unfold. So he said, Francis, meet me here tomorrow morning at nine o'clock and I'll give you a tour of the White House. She did that. She showed up the next morning, right on time. And the exec from Ford, whose name was not mentioned, gave her a tour of the White House. It happened to be a day where there's a lot going on across the world, a lot of important meetings, high-level secret sessions. He assumed we probably won't get to see the president, but we'll get as close as we can. But sure enough, the word got to Ronald Reagan that Francis Green was in the hall, and he walked out to her, and he said, Francis, I'm so sorry, those computers fouled up again, and we didn't get you on the list. If I'd known you were coming, I would have come out there to get you myself. He then invited her to sit down in the Oval Office and talk about her life, her town in California, her family. The President of the United States gave her a lot of time that day, more time than he had. Some would say it was time wasted. But those who say that didn't know Ronald Reagan. He knew this woman had nothing to give him, but she needed something he could give her. And so on that day, he gave her the memory of a lifetime and encouraged her. Don't ever underestimate the power of an encouraging act of kindness or an encouraging word. I'm going to close in prayer. And after I do in all of our rooms, the prayer teams will be making their way to the front of the rooms even now. And they'll be available to pray with you about anything that may be on your mind or any prayer uh, you have that you would love someone to uh, say over you or say with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of this place, for the privilege of worship. We thank you for the women in our lives and in this church. We thank you for Mother's Day. Father, we pray for those who will find Mother's Day to be very painful. We are mindful of those, our sisters in Christ, in this church and beyond. But Father, today I pray, more than anything, we might be an encouraging word to someone. Give that encouraging word generously and let someone know that we think they're special. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.